Hi everyone, it's me Heather Jo and today we're talking about the built environment. So when we study the built environment, before we get into doing really cool things like building cob benches and building hobbit villages and and cool places for our communities to hang out and learn and interact and places for us to live, before we get into building spaces out of renewable and recycled materials, Yes, that's a big part of this, but it's really important that first we look at where we are now and at the structures that we live in already, the structures that already exist. I would like to give you a little slideshow and just go through a few examples of both new built environments and ways to integrate the existing built environment with our natural surroundings. And we'll look at some examples and then I'll use my own patio here where we spend a lot of time as sort of a case study. Here's a bench. This is a cob bench and it was built uh, during the Portland City Repair Project during one of the early years of the City Repair Project. It's still there today and it's on a street where there's a lot of pedestrian traffic and there's the people who live there have a very small front yard space and so they chose not to garden there and they don't have a fence. They just have this bench and people are welcome to sit there. So it's a wonderful way to build community and to just have sort of a passive and beautiful space that is part of the built environment that invites contemplation and interaction from your neighbors. So this would be an example of a built project not a retrofit or uh, or an example of integrating with the existing built environment. So this is one of the projects that you can do if you're really feeling creative and also if you have surplus resources. You know if you have piles of rock and I think they had some urbanite, they had ripped up a chunk of sidewalk on the other side of their house and so they used part of that to build this bench. So it was a nice way to use up those resources and keep them on site. So here's more of a traditional looking home, however has been completely retrofitted with solar panels and 100% renewable energy. And this is a really cool example of how you can live in a space that's completely aesthetically and traditionally beautiful and still integrate new and innovative techniques. There was no reason to tear down this house and build a new straw bale home on the site. It made a lot more sense to retrofit the building. This is a structure that was built from the ground up as an ecological structure. Right. Every single detail is designed to be as ecological as possible. So that's always fun to engage in a project like that, especially if you are working with a large community of people. The goal here is for your home, whether you've built it or not, to be operating on a completely closed loop system, right? So that your family and your basic needs are met, but also you're giving more than you take back to the environment and you're growing seeds and you're giving them away and you're building soil and you're improving the land on which you live, where you're recycling all of your water and you're recycling all of your paper and keeping everything on site and catching and storing as much energy as possible and keeping everything really, really tight. So there's lots of ways to do that and that is part of the built environment and that crosses over into studying appropriate technology and agriculture and, you know, as with all aspects of our permaculture study, everything's interconnected. So there are so many different things that you can do with recycled materials and you can build beautiful multifunctional structures that literally used to be a pile of junk on site. So I encourage you to experiment with that and to, to see what you can manifest by using existing resources and existing ways, turning that into functional aspects of your built environment. But the built environment and your study of the built environment should absolutely include existing structures, all existing structures, fences, gates, walls, any sorts of outbuildings or sheds. And if you've got some, some crazy contraptions already built up, then you have to consider whether to tear those apart and reuse the materials for something else or whether to just let them be a part of the aesthetic and, and to design around them. So a lot of times we find ourselves designing around the existing built environment and or changing it to suit the design. So this is a really important decision to make and you shouldn't default to one or the other. You should really think through each step of it critically. That the goal here is to integrate the landscape with the home. There's lots of flux that can happen within the built environment and ideally that's all something that you're conscious of and aware of with your design. So moving on to using my patio here as a case study. 
And, and I'll just take you through a few of the spots here. So when we got here, there was already this beautifully built patio and we're out here every day and there's lots of things that we use it for. It's multifunctional space. If you have a small house and you have a big outside patio, I think that makes a really nice combination. And then you can build your greenhouses and your gardens all around that and you become really integrated. So this is the main area. So when I step out of my out of my kitchen, out of the front door of my house, then here's the main dining table. And then the patio just opens out onto our garden right here. So right there, there's a bunch of different functions that the built environment is serving and it's integrated with the garden. So it creates vertical growing areas. There's microclimates of many kinds lines all around the patio where certain plants will only do well right there and there's seeding and there's an area for drying sometimes seeds or herbs or fruits there is a dining in the workspace with a very large uh, central table where we do stuff and then lots of vertical space and so also in the main doorway we have these um, seasonally we have house martins who come and live here and they're very beneficial and they live in a couple different spots in our patio and they come back year after year and so this patio creates habitat for them uh, it also holds up the gutter and transports our rainwater from the roof to different parts of the garden it uh, the bricks the brick columns create heat retention so it's quite warm here even in the coldest months and the fr on the front, on the south facing wet front of our patio are many more different micro microclimates and there's a lot of different kinds of plants growing out there that none of the neighbors really can grow because they just didn't build this type of patio right on the water line which is such a simple thing to do. So down at the end of our patio, there is a built-in barbecue that whoever designed the patio was into barbecuing and they built this little chiminea and then there's a laundry sink right there. I turned into my little potting shed and that's where I do all the plant propagation and it's ideal for that. It was almost like it was designed to be a potting shed and I'm very proud of this little um, microclimate that I noticed here with the barbecue because there's a little shaded area which is nice when it's hot in the summer and I'm trying to get seeds started and there's easily available water, there's a gray water bucket, there's a very hot microclimate right on the south side of it up against the white wall so I can do cool cacti and it never freezes there and then there's a table for hardening off and it's a wonderful little work zone. So moving further down, so our patio turns into a grape arbor which is paved over and underneath that is our, our septic tank. So the septic tank doubles as a patio basically. It's, it's paved over the top and then there's a wall and that's the, the north boundary of the site where we live. That creates a long shady zone and then it doubles as, as a grape arbor. We hang up a hammock there in the summer. The dogs love to run and play on it. Uh, it provides storage for bikes and ladders and it creates microclimates also on the south side of that because it's very shady but still wet because the water still runs down to there. So all of these different areas in the built environment are creating microclimates. If you haven't noticed, that is the main theme of this. And you, that becomes the gateway. So the microclimates are the areas where you're gonna connect the biological parts of your design to the physical and, and non-biological parts of your design. So even our entryway, there's just a little paved area where we come down the driveway. Once we come through the gate, there's a slight slope at the bottom of the driveway and that drains water away from the house and into the garden and creates yet another microclimate. Well, now it's nighttime here in Andalusia, but here's what I'm trying to explain to you by showing you all of the different ways in which my built environment is interacting with the biological environment on my permaculture site. If you can tune in to every single time that happens and make best use of all of those edges and all of those interconnected opportunities, then when it comes time to build contraptions and newfangled structures and, and uh, innovations, then you will be fully prepared to design them. So start with where you are, build out, work through the zones and sectors, same as every other layer. So as you're moving through, learning how to build these gardens and food forests and eco-villages, always tune in to how that built environment is connecting to the ecological systems. Okay, see you soon.